I got a five-year-old, so I wanted to make sure that he could run around and have a good time. I just felt like it was a good place for me to call home for a little bit. Get ready for a tour of the most incredible homes you've ever seen. And guess what? They're all for sale, but there are no takers. Why? That's the big question. Today, we're exploring the fanciest homes of the stars that are surprisingly still waiting for buyers. From massive mansions to plush penthouses, we're uncovering the secrets of why. Number eight, Liza Minnelli. Liza Minnelli inherited more than fame from her parents. Among these was a Beverly Hills estate, steeped in her family's history. This house, once a symbol of Hollywood luxury, was heavily influenced by her father, Vincent Minnelli, a famous movie director known for his grand style. The estate was a sight to behold. Vincent's touch was everywhere, from the luxurious furniture to the grand chandeliers. It was more than a house. It was a piece of Hollywood history, a reminder of the Minnelli family's place in the world of glamour and fame. After Vincent passed away, the mansion became a source of family drama. His will said his fourth wife, Lee, could live there as long as she wanted. This caused trouble when Liza wanted to sell it. What followed was a tangle of legal fights and family arguments, turning the once proud mansion into a battleground. Now, the mansion sits empty, a shadow of its former glory. The laughter and music of the past are gone, replaced by silence. Number seven, Courtney Love. Courtney Love, the renowned singer and widow of Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain, stepped into a different world with her purchase of a country retreat in Olympia, Washington State. This property, acquired in 1995, about a year after Cobain's passing, represented a contrast to the life she led in the public eye. Set on a sprawling seven acres, the retreat was envisioned as a peaceful haven, a place for love to find peace away from the spotlight. The property, however, told a story of gradual decline. Initially, it held the rustic charm typical of a country home, with three bedrooms and two bathrooms nestled in nature. But as years passed, the retreat, which Love never actually lived in, began to show signs of neglect. The once inviting space was overtaken by the relentless march of nature, with overgrown greenery and a structure slowly yielding to time. Selling this retreat proved to be a challenge. In 2011, Love attempted to sell the property but couldn't find a buyer. By 2018, when she put it on the market again for $320,000, the house was described as a significant renovation project. It required extensive work to restore it to a habitable state, a far cry from the idyllic retreat it once was. Eventually, a buyer was found and the property was sold. The new owners faced the task of reviving the estate, transforming it from a symbol of past sorrows to a rejuvenated home, ready to start a new chapter. Number six, Muhammad Hadid. Muhammad Hadid made headlines with his ambitious project in Bel Air. Known for his lavish developments, Hadid started building a mansion that was meant to be the height of luxury. However, the journey of this Bel Air mansion was anything but smooth. Hadid initially planned for a 14,000 square foot property, but as construction progressed, the mansion expanded significantly, eventually covering a staggering 30,000 square feet. This expansion wasn't just grand, it was controversial. It led to a series of legal battles as Hadid pushed the limits of what was permissible adding floors and features without the necessary permits. The local community was up in arms. The mansion, dubbed the Starship Enterprise by neighbors, became a symbol of excessive ambition and disregard for regulations. The legal issues culminated in a ruling that declared the property a danger to the community, leading to a decision that no developer wanted to hear. The mansion had to be demolished. Number five, Nelly. Nelly, the rapper who skyrocketed to fame with hits like Hot In Hair, made a splash in the real estate world with the purchase of a grand Tuscan-style mansion. Located in the St. Louis suburb of Wildwood, Missouri, this mansion was a symbol of Nelly's success, bought at the peak of his career in 2002 for nearly $2 million. The property, sprawling over a 12-acre lot, boasted panoramic views, but the mansion remained unsold for almost two decades. The 10,800-square-foot property, complete with castle-like turrets and a white stucco finish, was an extravagant display of wealth. However, reports suggested that Nelly never intended to live there. His plan was to flip the property, 
But for reasons unknown, this plan never materialized. In a surprising turn of events, the property was sold in 2021 for less than a million dollars to the Kingdom of God Global Church. This sale sparked local rumors and speculation. Some neighbors even suggested that the church might be a cult, adding a layer of mystery to the mansion's story. Number 4. Tommy Lee Tommy Lee, the famous drummer from Motley Crue, bought a fancy mansion in Calabasas, California. The mansion, sprawling over 10,000 square feet, was a marvel of modern architecture. It had six bedrooms, eight bathrooms, and an array of features that could dazzle anyone. Among its most distinctive elements were an atrium with indoor waterfalls, a retractable glass roof, and a pool shaped like a grand piano. The property also included a KOE pond, a stone saltwater spa, and a variety of luxurious amenities that made it stand out in the affluent Calabasas neighborhood. However, selling this unique property proved challenging. Initially listed close to the price Lee paid for it, the mansion struggled to find a buyer. The market for such a personalized and extravagant property was limited. As a result, Lee had to reduce the price significantly. After years on the market, the property eventually sold for $3.6 million, a steep drop from his asking price. Adding to the mansion's selling woes were rumors that it was haunted. Lee's wife, Brittany Ferlin, shared stories of strange occurrences in the house which may have deterred potential buyers. The mansion's sale marked the end of an era for Lee, a chapter filled with as much drama and intrigue as his life in the spotlight. Number three, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, a name that resonates with basketball greatness, made an equally impressive mark in the world of luxury real estate with his extravagant Chicago mansion. Located in Highland Park, this mansion is a marvel of luxury and style. Covering over 56,000 square feet, it boasts nine bedrooms, 15 bathrooms, and a host of amenities that befit a sports superstar. The property features a full-size basketball court, fitting for the NBA legend, a massive home gym, a cigar room reflective of Jordan's known tastes, and a luxurious pool area. The mansion's gate, famously adorned with the number 23 Arsar, Jordan's jersey number, adds to its unique charm. However, selling this magnificent property proved to be a challenge. Despite its luxurious amenities and the prestige of being owned by Jordan, the mansion has lingered on the market. Originally listed at $29 million, the price has seen significant adjustments over the years. As of now, the mansion remains unsold, a surprising fact given Jordan's continued fame and the property's opulent features. It stands as a symbol of Jordan's legacy, yet to find a buyer who matches its grandeur and history. Number two, Donald Trump. Donald Trump, known for real estate and politics, bought a big fancy mansion that matched his bold personality. Before his foray into the political arena, Trump was known for his high profile business ventures, particularly in real estate. And this mansion was a testament to his taste for luxury. This particular mansion, a symbol of Trump's wealth and status, was designed to impress. It boasted all the trappings of luxury one would expect from a property associated with Trump. The mansion's grandeur was evident in its expansive rooms, high-end finishes, and extravagant decor. However, the journey of this mansion in the real estate market was not without its challenges. The property struggled to find a buyer. Trump's shift from business to politics brought a new level of scrutiny and controversy impacting the sales prospects of his real estate holdings. As of now, the mansion standing in the market remains a topic of interest. Its fate is tied not just to its luxurious features, but also to the ever-changing public perception of its high-profile owner. The property, much like Trump himself, continues to be a subject of public fascination and debate. Number one, Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston, a name that echoes through the halls of music history, had an equally notable presence in the world of real estate with her New Jersey estate. Located in Mendham Township, the estate was a sprawling 12,500 square feet of elegance and comfort. It featured five bedrooms, five bathrooms, a tennis court, and an indoor pool. Perhaps its most significant feature was the recording studio, where some of Houston's most iconic hits were produced. This estate was a creative haven for Houston. However, Following Houston's tragic passing, the estate's story took a turn. Selling the property became a challenge. The estate, tied so closely to Houston's legacy, struggled to find a buyer who could look beyond its celebrity connection. That's a wrap on our tour of some amazing mansions with surprising stories. 
it's clear that even the fanciest homes can have their ups and downs in finding new owners. These places show us that there's often more than meets the eye in the world of big houses and famous owners. Recently, a viral video came to light claiming to show footage of an abandoned property formerly occupied by Hollywood star Sylvester Stallone. The video came as a result of the urban explorer craze. Urban explorers are people who explore abandoned properties, typically for the purposes of filming the escapades and uploading them on the internet. Most of the time, the videos uploaded are only of interest to other urban explorers. But the video that claimed to show footage of Sylvester Stallone's property appealed to another demographic. That demographic is fans of the revered Rocky and Rambo actor. The video showed an abandoned brick house with a yard that had long since become overgrown. The house appeared as if whoever had previously occupied it had left in the spur of the moment as there was food rotting in the refrigerator. There were also a plethora of luxury cars that had seemingly been abandoned on the property. Fans of Stallone know that the actor is a fan of luxury cars, but the simple fact of there being luxury cars wasn't the only thing that caused them to theorize that it belonged to Sylvester. The biggest clue was vanity license plates featured on the vehicles. There were numerous license plates featuring Sylvester's nickname, Sly, including plates that said Sly, Sly 2, and Sly 3. Even more suspicious, one of the license plates was featured on a Clinet luxury car. These cars are especially rare, and Sylvester is known to own one. Fact checkers have been keeping busy. The video was apparently of a property found in Maryland, with the license plates being registered either in Maryland or Washington, D.C. After the video went viral, Stallone fans got a hold of Maryland authorities and were able to determine that the cars with Maryland license plates were registered to someone other than Sly Stallone. But this information has yet to be gathered for the Washington, D.C. plates. The fact that the Maryland cars aren't registered to Stallone may seem like proof that the star is not the owner. However, it's possible the actor had the cars registered under a different name or to someone else. Another piece of evidence is the fact that the actor grew up in Maryland, and he grew up in a brick house. Because of this, many have speculated that the property is none other than the childhood home of the actor. Fans believe he may have purchased his childhood home for nostalgic purposes, only to abandon it due to financial difficulties. There is certainly a lot of evidence suggesting that the video was, in fact, a document of Sylvester Stallone's decaying wealth. However, there seems to be more evidence suggesting that the property belonged to someone else entirely. Besides the Maryland cars being registered to someone else, there's also the fact of the matter that the star's childhood home has been put on the market several times in the past few years and that it doesn't match up with the layout of the property featured in the video. The property has a giant yard, whereas Sly's childhood home doesn't. Did the property belong to a Frenchman? Scrolling through the responses on the viral Urban Explorers video, many people have suggested it belonged to a wealthy Frenchman who passed away a few years ago. This man was known to have purchased cars that formerly belonged to Sylvester Stallone, which could explain the vanity license plates. As far as the presence of the rare Clenet, this also could be explained by the wealthy Frenchman theory. The Frenchman who was supposed to have owned the property was the brother of the Clenet creator. The wealthy Frenchman theory garnered a lot of traction after it was posted via YouTube comments, but it has since been largely debunked. It's certainly true that the brother of the Clenet creator passed away and left a lot of cars in property limbo. It's also true that these cars included a Clenet and some other vehicles that had been purchased from Stallone at some point. But the abandoned property of this late Frenchman has since been revealed in another Urban Explorers video, and this made it all too clear that the Frenchman's abandoned cars are not the same as the ones found in Maryland. It's just a big coincidence. Stallone fans then became desperate for other theories to explain the viral video away. There's been one more theory that has managed to carry some weight. It suggests that the abandoned property featured in the video belongs to Sly Stone, the leader of the musical group Sly and the Family Stone. This would explain the vanity license plates. Sly Stone having abandoned the property would also make a lot more sense financially than Stallone having abandoned it. While Sylvester is estimated to be worth around $400 million, Sly Stone is verifiably homeless. 
Sylvester previously abandoned his Palm Springs mansion. Given the current facts, it seems more likely that the property belongs to Sly Stone. But muddying the waters of the story even more is the fact that there was a property that Sylvester certifiably did abandon in the 2010s. Prior to 2010, Sylvester lived in a Palm Springs mansion among some of the wealthiest citizens of California. Even though he's worth $400 million, he started to feel like the odd one out amongst these wealthy citizens and decided he wanted to find a home someplace else. He found a new place in Palm Beach, Florida and left his Palm Springs home abandoned. His mansion was abandoned for several years before it was recently sold to pop idol Adele for a staggering sum. During the time it was abandoned, there were many luxury cars sitting at it. It wasn't technically abandoned as it was on the market, but it was so expensive that it took many years to be sold. It sold for $58 million, and Sylvester downsized to a home that only cost $35 million. Despite that downgrade, it seems Sylvester is far from being in dire financial straits. In the web of rumors that has come about as a result of the viral Urban Explorers video, the one certifiable truth would seem to be that Sylvester Stallone is a man who loves his luxury cars. Whether or not the luxury cars that were abandoned ever belonged to Sylvester is still open for debate, but he has plenty of them in his collection. Some of the most prized cars in his collection include his Bugatti Veyron, 1932 High Boy Hot Rod, and Rolls-Royce Phantom. Sylvester Stallone is still a high roller. Stallone's Bugatti Veyron seems to be his favorite car to drive around in. It cost a staggering $1.7 million and it's painted all black. It has 1,200 horsepower and is said to reach 60 miles an hour in just under three seconds. If Sylvester ever finds himself in a situation where he needs money fast, he could sell this car and live for a couple years just off of that. His 1932 High Boy Hot Rod gets out less, but it's just as impressive. In fact, this 330 horsepower beauty may be even more impressive than the competition on account of its classic status. Finally, the most luxurious car in Stallone's vast and impressive collection may very well be his Rolls-Royce Phantom. It's another vehicle he loves going out on the town in. It boasts 453 horsepower, more than enough for taking Sylvester to and from his fancy dinners. All things considered, it appears as if the iconic Rocky and Rambo star is pretty far from having to abandon his luxurious life. Goldie and Kurt's Malibu House Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell, renowned Hollywood power couple, made headlines in 2013 when they decided to part ways with their luxurious Malibu beach home. Nestled along the pristine coastline of one of California's most coveted beachfront locations, their property exuded elegance and charm, offering a retreat that epitomized coastal living. The Malibu Beach home boasted breathtaking views of the Pacific, with its expansive windows inviting in the golden California sunlight and the soothing sound of waves crashing against the shore. Spread across a generous expanse of land, the property provided ample space for both relaxation and entertainment, making it a haven for anyone seeking a serene coastal lifestyle. The architecture was a seamless blend of contemporary design and beachside charm. The interior featured spacious living areas adorned with high-end finishes and tasteful decor. A gourmet kitchen with state-of-the-art appliances offered the perfect setting for culinary delights, while multiple bedrooms and bathrooms provided comfort and privacy for guests. Despite all this and its undeniable allure, the Malibu Beach House lingered on the market for a while, its asking price reflecting the exclusivity of its location and the luxury it offered. Potential buyers no doubt recognize the appeal of owning a slice of paradise in one of SoCal's most desirable neighborhoods, but perhaps the timing or other factors didn't align. Nevertheless, the home's eventual sale marked the end of an era for Kurt and Goldie, who undoubtedly cherished countless memories created within its walls. Their LA Home in 2017, Goldie and Kurt bid farewell to another piece of their real estate portfolio, this time parting ways with their stunning Palisades Riviera home. Situated in one of LA's most prestigious neighborhoods, the property epitomized luxury living with its impeccable design, breathtaking views, and exclusive amenities. Perched atop a hillside, the Riviera home commanded panoramic vistas of the city skyline and the Pacific, offering a rare combo of tranquility and urban sophistication. The exterior had warmth and opulence, with spacious living areas bathed in natural light. 
Vaulted ceilings adorned with intricate detailing added grandeur to the space. It had an array of amenities, like a gourmet chef's kitchen with top-of-the-line appliances and a private screening room perfect for hosting movie nights. There was lush gardens, a sparkling pool, and inviting outdoor seating areas. But the Riviera home faced a similar fate as its Malibu counterpart lingering on the market for a while before finally finding its new owner. Justin Bieber's Beverly Hills Mansion Justin Bieber's mansion, nestled in the exclusive neighborhood of Beverly Hills, captivated onlookers with its grandeur and luxury. Boasting modern architecture and sprawling grounds, this palatial estate featured all the amenities fit for a pop sensation. With multiple bedrooms, state-of-the-art kitchen facilities, and entertainment areas, the mansion epitomized California living at its finest. Despite its undeniable appeal, the property faced challenges in finding a buyer perhaps due to its hefty price tag or the discerning tastes of potential purchasers. Nevertheless, Bieber's former home stood as a testament to his success and status in the entertainment industry. Meg Ryan's Soho Loft Meg Ryan's stylish loft in New York City's vibrant Soho neighborhood offered a glimpse into the actress's sophisticated taste and urban lifestyle. With its chic design, exposed brick walls, and soaring ceilings, the loft exuded downtown charm and elegance. Featuring spacious living areas, designer finishes, and panoramic views of the city, it was a coveted retreat for anyone seeking the epitome of New York living. But despite the allure, Ryan's loft faced challenges finding a buyer, perhaps due to the competitive real estate market or the unique layout of the property. Nevertheless, it remained a coveted piece of celebrity real estate. Tommy Hilfiger's Plaza Hotel Penthouse Tommy Hilfiger's penthouse in the iconic Plaza Hotel, situated in the heart of New York City, epitomized luxury living with its opulent design and unparalleled views of Central Park. Boasting classic elegance and timeless sophistication, the penthouse featured lavish interiors adorned with exquisite furnishings and artwork, creating unparalleled grandeur. With its prime location and world-class amenities, including access to the hotel's prestigious services and facilities, the penthouse was the epitome of Manhattan luxury. But his residents faced challenges in finding a buyer, perhaps due to a sky-high price tag, or the exclusive nature of Plaza Hotel living. Oprah Winfrey's Chicago Condo Oprah Winfrey's condo and Chicago's prestigious Water Tower Place offered a glimpse into the media mogul's refined taste and urban lifestyle. Situated in the heart of downtown Chicago, the condo boasted panoramic views of the city's skyline and Lake Michigan, providing a backdrop of unparalleled beauty. With its sleek design and high-end finishes, the residence exuded sophistication and elegance, offering a luxurious retreat in the midst of the bustling city. But Oprah's condo faced challenges in finding a buyer, perhaps because of the competitive nature of the Chicago real estate market. Michael Jordan's Mansion Michael Jordan's mansion, located in Highland Park, Illinois, has been a notable fixture in the real estate market for several years. This sprawling estate, often referred to as Legend Point, reflects the basketball icon's legendary status and penchant for luxury living. Boasting nine bedrooms, 15 bathrooms, and a staggering 56,000 square feet of living space, the mansion is a testament to grandeur and opulence. Designed with meticulous attention to detail, it has amenities fit for a sports superstar, including a full-size basketball court, a state-of-the-art fitness center, a home theater, and a putting green. It offers a private retreat from the hustle of everyday life and has a tennis court, a pool pavilion with a spa and a pool house, and a picturesque pond. Despite its undeniable appeal and impressive features, Jordan's mansion has faced challenges in finding a buyer. The property initially went on the market in 2012 with an asking price of $29 million, but subsequent price reductions and adjustments have failed to attract a buyer willing to meet its lofty price tag. John Travolta's Main Estate John Travolta's main island estate, located on the secluded Islesboro Island, is a retreat that epitomizes coastal luxury and tranquility. This property, known as Flying W, served as a private escape for the actor and his family. 
Spanning over 48 acres and its lush greenery overlooking Penobscot Bay, the estate provides ample space for relaxation and outdoor recreation. The centerpiece is the magnificent 10,830-square-foot mansion showcasing traditional New England architecture and exquisite craftsmanship. Despite its allure, though, Travolta put the estate on the market for sale. But despite occasional interest, the property failed to find a buyer and is currently back off the market. Michael Jordan's Illinois Mansion Michael Jordan, an icon in basketball and a household name globally, has faced an unexpected opponent off the court, the real estate market. His Illinois mansion, a sprawling 56,000-square-foot estate, stands as a monument to his success. Purchased in 1991 for $2 million, this luxurious property boasts nine bedrooms, 15 bathrooms, and an array of amenities befitting a sports legend, including a full-size indoor basketball court, a gymnasium, and a cigar room. Despite these impressive features and Jordan's fame, the mansion has been on the market for over 11 years, with its price plummeting from an initial $29 million to $14.9 million. The property's highly personalized nature, like the entrance gates adorned with Jordan's jersey number 23, might be deterring potential buyers who prefer a more neutral space. 50 Cent's Connecticut Mansion the story of 50 Cent's Connecticut Mansion is a tale of extravagance and the challenges of finding a buyer for such a unique property. Originally listed for $18.5 million in 2015, this 50,000 square foot mansion's price has been slashed to $5.995 million. The home is a testament to luxury, featuring 21 bedrooms, 25 bathrooms, an indoor pool and hot tub, a nightclub, an indoor court, multiple game rooms, a green screen room, and a recording studio. Despite these lab amenities, the mansion's over-the-top nature and the niche appeal of its features have made it a difficult sell. Matt Lauer's Hamptons Estate Matt Lauer, a familiar face in American television, has encountered significant challenges selling his Hamptons estate. Initially listed for $17.995 million in July of 2016, the price of this 8,000-square-foot home has been reduced to $14.9 million. Nestled on a 25-acre private lot, the property exudes traditional elegance and is designed for luxury living and entertainment. But Lauer's personal controversies have overshadowed the property's allure. John Travolta's Main Island Estate Travolta, a multi-talented actor and producer with a career spanning more than five decades, has faced difficulties selling his Main Island estate. Purchased in 1991, this 11,000-square-foot property was built in 1903 and features 20 bedrooms. Despite its historical significance and Travolta's fame, the property has struggled to find a buyer since being listed in February 2021. The estate's maximalist country-style interior, adorned with a mix of colors, patterns, and ornate furnishings may not align with the tastes of the average home buyer. Ellen DeGeneres and Portia de Rossi's Los Angeles Condo DeGeneres and de Rossi, known for their knack for flipping and reselling mansions, have surprisingly hit a roadblock with their L.A. condo. Listed at $8 million, this property has been awaiting a buyer since 2014. It embodies modern luxury and style and represents the unpredictability and often capricious nature of the real estate market. Even with their established reputation and success in real estate, Allen and Porsche's venture with this condo demonstrates that market trends and buyer preferences can be fickle and unpredictable. The property, with its high-end design and prime location, seems to tick all the boxes, but it remains unsold. The S.K. Pierce Mansion the S.K. Pierce Mansion, a Victorian-era marvel built in the 1870s, stands as a testament to architectural grandeur and historical significance. Once the residence of Sylvester Pierce, a wealthy industrialist, the mansion has been embroiled in tales of the supernatural, casting a shadow over its marketability. Despite its stunning architectural features and rich history, the mansion's reputation as a haunted house has significantly impacted its appeal. Listed at a surprisingly low $329, thousand dollars this property's struggle in the market highlights the powerful influence of folklore and public perception in real estate potential buyers deterred by the stories of hauntings overlook the mansion's potential as a unique historical residence or a lucrative investment as a tourist attraction celine dion's jupiter island compound 
Celine Dion, the Canadian singer whose voice has captivated audiences worldwide, is as renowned for her real estate ventures as she is for her chart-topping hits like The Power of Love and the iconic My Heart Will Go On from Titanic. Dion, who made Forbes' American self-made women's list in 2021 with a net worth of $800 million, has invested in several lavish homes, including a sprawling vacation retreat on Jupiter Island, Florida. She purchased the estate in early 2008 for over $7 million. She embarked on a grand project to create a Bahamian-inspired mansion, which was completed in 2010. This luxurious holiday home is not just a house, but a compound, featuring a vast main home and five separate pavilions. The property boasts 13 bedrooms and 14 bathrooms, along with 415 feet of beach frontage, making it a true beachfront paradise. The estate is a testament to Dion's taste for opulence. It houses two ocean view verandas, a tennis pavilion with a golf range simulator, a pool house, an outdoor kitchen, and a beachside cabana with a massage room. The grounds include three geothermal heated swimming pools, a commercial grade water slide, and a four car garage. Every aspect of the property reflects Dion's status as a global superstar. Despite its grandeur, her compound faced significant challenges in the real estate market. Initially listed in 2013 for $72.5 million, the property underwent several price reductions over the years. It dropped to $45.5 million, then to $38.5 million in January 2017. It finally sold in April of 2017 for $28 million after four years on the market. The struggle to sell this magnificent property can be attributed to several factors. Its scale and price likely deterred many potential buyers. Additionally, the local annual taxes, which exceed $350,000, may have played a role in dissuading interested parties. The estate's bespoke nature, tailored to Dion's specific tastes and lifestyle, may have also limited its appeal to a broader market. Celine's journey in selling her Jupiter Island compound is a fascinating glimpse into the challenges faced by celebrities in the real estate market. Her story illustrates that even the most luxurious and well-appointed properties can struggle to find buyers, especially when they are as customized and unique as this Bahamian-inspired mansion. Dion's experience in the real estate market is a reminder that celebrity status and luxurious amenities do not always guarantee a quick sale in the complex world of high-end real estate. The house that was once the family home of Vincenti Minnelli and his daughter Liza is unrecognizable today. The Minnellis moved into the house during the 1950s, and since then, a lot has happened in the home. Liza Minnelli's abandoned childhood home, it unfolds a tragedy just like you would see in the movies. An anonymous person contacted Curbed Los Angeles, which is a comprehensive real estate website about a sprawling and neglected Beverly Hills mansion on Crescent Drive. The website didn't know much about the property, nor did the tipster. After the first time the tipster drove by the mansion, though, they drove past many more times over the next few months. When Curbed Los Angeles did some research, they found out that the house once belonged to musical movie director Vincenti Minnelli and his family. They were Hollywood royalty at one time. The house was built in 1925 and was later redesigned by the famed Hollywood Regency architect John Elgin Wolfe. Very little is known about the people who lived in the mansion before the Minnelli family bought it in the 1950s. When he purchased the estate, Vincenti was hitting new heights in his career and he was incredibly successful. Unfortunately, his private life was not going as well. It was actually becoming more and more tumultuous. About 10 years before Vincenti and his family moved into the Beverly Hills mansion, his directing career was really taking off. He signed with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer in the 1940s, which is what helped build his career. After completing his first film, Cabin in the Sky, in 1943, he made a name for himself. The next year was a very pivotal time for Vincenti, both professionally and personally, when he started his next major project, Meet Me in St. Louis. On the set, he fell for the film's leading lady, Judy Garland. A year later, they were married. Their lives changed the day their daughter was born. The wedding took place in June 1945, and on March 12, 1946, their daughter, Liza Minnelli, was born. Right after she was born, Liza became the center of her parents' world. From the outside, the family seemed to be the perfect Hollywood family. On the inside, things weren't as great. 
Vincenti's professional life continued to flourish as he created amazing movies for MGM. Unfortunately, his married life wasn't doing as well. Judy was suffering from depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, and it was very well known. It was even the topic of an article in The New Yorker. Sadly, Judy's problems were tearing her family apart. While Judy was drowning in her mental health and substance abuse issues, Vincente had only two priorities. First, he loved his work. Second, he loved to dote on his daughter Liza. According to Judy, this left no time for her. As things got worse for Judy, she was released from her contract with MGM, and that only made things worse for Judy Garland. She tried to take her own life after that twice. By 1950, just five years into their marriage, things were falling apart. When Judy was released from MGM, she was at the lowest point in her life. Her unhappy marriage wasn't helping, and that led to her having an affair with businessman Sidney Luft. This ended the couple's marriage for good, and they were divorced in 1951. While this was a difficult time for Vincenti as well, he found great success in the same year, which eased the pain that he felt when the marriage failed. Shortly after the divorce, he won his first Academy Award for An American in Paris. It was then that he moved into the Beverly Hills estate. Back then, the mansion was very impressive. It looked nothing like what it looks like today. The mansion was located on Crescent Drive, and it spanned 5,900 square feet. There were 19 rooms in the house, with six bedrooms, six bathrooms, a formal dining room, and more. He moved into the mansion with his second wife, Georgette Magnani, and they were living the life of A-listers. According to an article published in the Los Angeles Times decades later, there were large dressing rooms in the house and many rooms dedicated to mementos from Vincenti's many movies. He wanted the home to be perfect for his beloved daughter, Liza, and he did his best to turn it into her dream house. When Vincenti and Judy divorced, Liza spent half the year with her mother and half the year with her father. Vincenti took every opportunity he could to dote upon his daughter. It's been reported that every year he commissioned new outfits for Liza, and no expense was spared when it came to her. He also hired state and film artist Tony Duquette to design a large playhouse for Liza. He had it placed within the estate's 42,500 square feet of land. At the time, things were going great for the director. He had plenty of money. Liza grew up in the mansion, and it was the place to be for other kids her age as well. Actress Candace Bergen remembers going over to the house where they would play dress-up. Vincenti would have a designer copy the costumes from famous leading ladies in MGM films and scale them down to fit a six-year-old. This gave Liza an incredible wardrobe to play dress-up with. Unfortunately, Vincenti's career was flailing, and he was no longer considered to be an in-demand director. By the late 1960s through the early 1970s, Liza had moved out of the home and Vincenti had moved on to his third wife. At this time, his funds were dwindling and his house took a hit. By 1976, Vincenti had directed his last film. With his career over, he could no longer afford the finer things in life. Many of his friends noticed that his house on Crescent Drive had changed quite a bit. While things were going horribly for Vincenti, things were going great for Liza. She had just won an Academy Award for Best Actress for her role in Cabaret. According to many reports, Liza came to her father's rescue. It's believed that she made several mortgage payments so that Vincenti wouldn't lose the house. By the time Vincenti was 83 years old, he was still living in the house but now with his fourth wife, Lee Anderson Minnelli. At the time, he was not well. Because he was ill, Liza went back to the Crescent Drive home to be close to him. She was only there for a few days before flying off to France for a scheduled performance, and while she was gone, Vincenti passed away. This led many to wonder what would become of the Crescent Drive estate. When Vincenti's will was read, his love for Liza was again proven. He left the house to her, but there was one stipulation. The $1.1 million estate was Liza's and he wanted to leave $100,000 to his last wife, Lee. He also wanted to be sure that Lee would be able to live in that house for as long as she liked. At first, the arrangement worked well for both ladies, but over time, things changed. By 1999, Vincenti had been gone for 13 years. Just as his will instructed, Vincent's widow, Lee, was still living in the Crescent Drive mansion. She was living there alone. 
That year, Lee was profiled by the Los Angeles Times in the House, and the interviewer got a glimpse into how the house had aged. According to the reporter, Lee changed nothing in the home. It was almost like a time capsule. His paints and easels remained precisely where Vincenti had left them in his dressing room before he died. In 2002, the utterly unchanged house was put up for sale by Liza, and Lee sued the actress. When Liza decided to sell her childhood home in the year 2000, she started quietly looking for a buyer. She finally sold it in 2002, but now that the house no longer belonged to Liza, what would Lee do? According to Liza, her father left her the house and asked that if she chose to sell it, that she would find a place for Lee to live. When Liza found a buyer for the home, she knew that Lee needed to be looked after. Honoring her father's wishes, Liza offered Lee a $450,000 tax-free condo. When Lee heard about the sale of the house and the offer of a condo, she responded by suing her stepdaughter. In her lawsuit, Lee claimed that Liza had the electricity turned off, that she dismissed all groundskeepers, and that Liza's neglect of the home led to Lee suffering from embarrassment, humiliation, worry, and extreme stress. She refused Liza's offer for a beautiful new home and claimed that after Liza got married and feeding 850 of her closest friends a 12-foot cake, she went off honeymooning all over the world. She says that during that time, she was alone in a cold, dark house at the age of 94. Just a month after she filed the lawsuit, she withdrew it. Liza and Lee worked out their issues without going through the courts. Lee was able to stay in her late husband's house, and the lawsuit delayed the sale of the house. The house officially sold in 2004, but the new owners couldn't take possession of the home until Lee died or left voluntarily. By the time escrow closed in 2006, Lee was 98 years old. At the time, Liza was paying Lee's rent to the new owners. Lee finally died in 2009, and the house was no longer Liza's responsibility. Also, she didn't have to pay any more rent, and that would allow the new owners of the home to move in. In 2006, Beverly Hills real estate agent Sheila Rose told the Times that although Lee was alive and living in the house, the new buyers would eventually move in and refurbish it. When Lee died, everyone was sure that a major remodel would begin. For some reason, though, it never did. The person who alerted curbed Los Angeles mentioned that there were torn drapes in the upstairs window. It was evident that squatters had been staying in the mansion. Much of the trash in the house was recently left there. There were some reminders of the glamorous home that Liza grew up in, but it's clear that those days were long gone. According to Lee's initial lawsuit, the groundskeepers were dismissed, and whether or not it was true is unknown. However, the new owners never hired anyone to care for the yard. This negligence resulted in a disaster. There are piles of debris all around the yard, and the columns are crumbling. The pool that was once luxurious and filled with crystal blue water is now empty, covered in graffiti. The walls inside the house are also covered with graffiti. The walls are full of holes. Many belongings were still in the home, but most of it was destroyed. The question on everyone's mind is, where are the owners of the house now? Enough time has passed that a renovation should have already begun, but instead the house has been neglected and is now far from the home of Hollywood royalty that it used to be. Inside the home are plenty of amazing artifacts from the time that Vincenti, Judy Garland, and Liza all lived in the house together. Since the new owners have possession of the house, everything inside is theirs they could be sitting on a treasure trove of pieces of Hollywood history, but instead have ignored the house and its contents, leaving it behind for squatters to take or destroy. Today, it is a far cry from what it once was. Maria Bartiromo's rise to financial news stardom. You have some fan nicknames, and we have to talk about this. I don't know if this is irritating to you, but it exists. A lot of your fans, you'll agree to this have these different, they call you the money honey, they call you the business babe, all this kind of stuff. I'm serious. Maria's journey to becoming one of the most recognizable faces in financial journalism is a testament to her determination and expertise. Born in Brooklyn, New York in 1967, she grew up in a family that valued hard work and entrepreneurship. Her father owned the Rex Manor restaurant where young Maria worked as a coat check girl, 
learning valuable lessons about customer service and the value of a dollar. Bartiromo's career in financial journalism began at CNN, where she worked as a producer and assignment editor. But it was her move to CNBC in 1993 that launched her into the spotlight. She made history as the first journalist to report live from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, breaking new ground in financial news coverage. Her pioneering work on the floor wasn't without challenges, though. Bartiromo often found herself jostled by traders, but she persevered, gaining respect for her tenacity and knowledge. This groundbreaking reporting style quickly earned her a devoted following and the nickname Money Honey, a moniker that, while flattering, sometimes overshadowed her journalistic credentials. Throughout her two decades at CNBC, Bartiromo became known for her ability to secure interviews with top CEOs and financial leaders. Her show Closing Bell with Maria Bartiromo became must-watch television for investors and financial professionals alike. My name is Maria Bartiromo. I've been with Fox for eight years. The defining moment for me at Fox was hosting a presidential primary debate. What is your plan? The $6.5 million East Side Townhouse. Welcome back. It was a big week of housing data. February existing home sales out yesterday, surging 9.5%. That was the largest monthly gain in a year. In 2007, Maria and her husband, Jonathan Steinberg, made headlines when they purchased a stunning townhouse on East 62nd Street in Manhattan for $6.5 million. This five-level residence, located east of 3rd Avenue, is a testament to their success and their taste for luxury. The townhouse boasts five bedrooms, providing ample space for the couple and any guests they might entertain. One of the standout features of the property is its 39-foot-long backyard garden, a rare amenity in the heart of New York City. The second floor of the home features a balcony that overlooks this private oasis, offering a perfect spot for relaxation after a long day of market analysis and interviews. Security was clearly a priority for the couple, as the home is equipped with a two-camera security system and a flat-screen monitor. This level of protection is understandable, given Bartiromo's high profile in the media world. The interior of the townhouse is just as impressive as the exterior. It features four working wood-burning fireplaces, adding warmth and charm to the living spaces. The kitchen, spanning an impressive 32 feet, is a dream for anyone who enjoys cooking or entertaining. Between the second floor's dining and drawing rooms, there's a wet bar, perfect for hosting cocktail parties or unwinding after a long day on Wall Street. While the townhouse was certainly not cheap, it's worth noting that the previous owners had purchased it for an even steeper $6.8 million in 2004. The slight decrease in price might reflect the changing real estate market at the time of the purchase. Life in the Hamptons. When you are in the public eye and you live in a fishbowl like I feel like I do, people will always have commentary about who you are, what kind of a person you are, what you look like. I, mean, I used to get, you know, we used to have a segment on CNBC called Buy, Sell, or Hold. And people would call up and ask for stock picks. But before they would ask my guest, Buy, Sell, or Hold, they would say to me things like, Maria, congratulations on the baby. You know, you're having a baby, you're pregnant. I've never been pregnant. You know, I mean, I, I, I must have gained five or 10 pounds or something. <laughs> While their Manhattan townhouse serves as their primary residence, Maria and Jonathan also own a beach house in the hamlet of West Hampton, New York. This second home provides the couple with a retreat from the hustle and bustle of city life. Bartiromo has spoken about how she and her husband enjoy spending time in the Hamptons, particularly on weekends. They often take advantage of the beautiful surroundings by going on long bike rides. Bartiromo has mentioned they frequently bike back and forth on the 14-mile-long road where their house is located, providing both exercise and a chance to enjoy the scenic beauty of the area. Even in cooler weather, the couple makes the most of their beach proximity. Bartiromo has shared they often bundle up for walks on the beach during the winter months. Behind the Scenes her daily routine. Why do you keep saying it's an election year? Because they will manipulate it. The White House and the Democrats are going to want to put lipstick on the pig. Maria Bartiromo's success in financial journalism is built on a foundation of hard work and discipline, as evidenced by her grueling daily schedule. Her day typically starts at the eye-watering hour of 3.30 a.m., a time when most of New York City is still fast asleep. The first thing she does is immerse herself in the latest news. She scours various news wires and websites, 
like the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, New York Post, and New York Times to get a comprehensive view of the day's events. By 4 a.m., her hair and makeup team arrive at her Manhattan home to get her camera ready. This is followed by a phone call with her production team to discuss the day's show. Another call follows at 5.30 a.m. for any last-minute changes or updates. Bartiromo typically arrives at the studio around 5 or 5.30, having already gone through the script and the show rundown with her producer. But she's always prepared for breaking news that might require a complete overhaul of the planned content. From 6 to 9 a.m., she hosts her show, Mornings with Maria, which features a packed lineup of guests ranging from government officials to CEOs and industry experts. After the show, her day continues with meetings, interviews, and preparation for future broadcasts. To manage this demanding schedule, she often tries to squeeze in a short nap during the day. She also practices yoga regularly, which she credits with helping her stay grounded amidst the chaos of her work life. Jonathan Steinberg, the man behind the scenes. While Maria is the more publicly recognizable half of this power couple, her husband Jonathan has made significant contributions to finance in his own right. He's the CEO of Wisdom Tree Investments, a company he founded after pivoting from the publishing industry. Under his leadership, Wisdom Tree has grown into a major player in the ETF market, managing billions of dollars in assets. Like his wife, he comes from a background steeped in finance. His father, Saul Steinberg, was a well-known corporate raider on Wall Street. But Jonathan has carved out his own niche in the financial world, focusing on innovative investment products rather than the aggressive takeover strategies his father was known for. Balancing career and personal life. And I think it's important to do that regularly, to uh, assess how you are living your life. One of the laws in the book is integrity. And I think at the end of the day, you know, we all know what the right thing to do is when we're faced with a dilemma. And, you know, people want to be around integrity. They want to associate themselves with integrity. You can be incredibly successful and not have integrity, but you can't be um, successful, truly successful, without integrity, I believe. Maintaining a work-life balance with such demanding careers is no small feat. Bartiromo has spoken about the challenges of managing her hectic schedule while still making time for her personal life. The couple's weekend retreats to their Hamptons home plays a critical role in this balance. The getaways provide an opportunity to unwind and reconnect away from the pressures of their high-profile jobs. She's also mentioned that she and Steinberg try to make time for social activities, albeit on the early side, to accommodate her sleep schedule. They enjoy dining out at some of New York's finest restaurants, including the Polo Bar and seafood spots like Milos or Avra. The future for Maria As of 2024, Maria Bartiromo continues to be a prominent figure in financial journalism. Her move to Fox Business in 2013 marked a new chapter in her career, allowing her to expand her coverage beyond just financial markets to broader economic and policy issues. At Fox, she hosts not only her daily morning show, but also two weekend programs, Maria Bartiromo's Wall Street and Sunday Morning Futures. These shows have allowed her to delve into more varied topics and secure interviews with a wide range of influential figures. It seems likely Bartiromo will continue to be an influential voice in financial media. Her ability to adapt to changing market conditions and viewer interests has served her well throughout her career. As for the $6.5 million mansion where she and Steinberg reside, it remains a testament to their success and a sanctuary from their demanding careers. Whether they're hosting industry colleagues for dinner parties or simply enjoying a quiet evening at home, this luxurious townhouse serves as both a symbol of their achievements and a private retreat from the public eye. Nancy's Homes Nancy Pelosi's house in Pacific Heights, San Francisco is a prominent property reflective of the upscale character of this affluent neighborhood. Pacific Heights is known for its stunning Victorian and Edwardian homes, panoramic views of the San Francisco Bay, and its status as one of the city's most desirable residential areas. Pelosi's house in Pacific Heights is a large mansion that offers luxurious living spaces and amenities. 
While specific details about the interior are not publicly available, it's safe to assume that as a wealthy and influential figure, her house features high-end finishes, spacious rooms, and possibly amenities like a private gym and home theater. The exterior is impressive with classic architectural features commonly found in the neighborhood. Given the high property values in Pacific Heights, Pelosi's house occupies a sizable lot with well-maintained gardens and outdoor living spaces. Situated atop of one of San Francisco's famous hills, the property has stunning views of the city skyline, the Golden Gate Bridge, and sparkling waters of the bay. Her house in Pacific Heights holds significance as her primary residence and serves as the base for her activities as a private citizen and as a public figure. It's where she retreats to relax with her friends and family, as well as where she hosts political events and meetings with constituents. Nancy's Vineyard Nancy Pelosi's vineyard and winery, Zinfandel Lane Vineyards, is in the renowned wine-producing region of St. Helena, California, in the Napa Valley. Her involvement with the vineyard reflects her family's long-standing connection to California and her interest in wine production. Zinfandel Lane Vineyards is situated in one of the most prestigious wine-growing regions in the world, known for its ideal climate and high-quality grape varietals. Napa Valley is renowned for Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, and Merlot grapes, among others. The Obamas President and Michelle Obama own several properties, and their wealth has grown exponentially since his time in office. The Obamas own a house in the Kenwood neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. This home holds significant personal and historical value for the family as it served as their primary residence before President Obama's presidency. The property is a stately brick mansion with elegant architectural features. In 2019, the Obamas purchased a sprawling estate on Martha's Vineyard, an affluent island off the coast of Massachusetts. The property spans approximately 29 acres in the Edgartown area and includes a large main house, guest houses, a swimming pool, and expansive grounds with views of the ocean. The estate provides the Obamas with a private retreat for relaxation and family gatherings. Following Obama's presidency, the family leased a residence in the Calorama neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Calorama is known for its grand homes and its popularity among politicians and diplomats. The Obamas' rental property offered them a comfortable and convenient base in the nation's capital. Each of these homes holds personal significance for the family and serves as a place for them to create memories, unwind, and enjoy time together. The Clintons President Clinton and Secretary Clinton own several properties reflecting their diverse interests and lifestyle preferences. They own a home in Chappaqua, a suburban town in Westchester County, New York. This property served as their primary residence after President Clinton's presidency, and it's where they spend a significant amount of their time when not traveling or at their other residences. The Chappaqua home is a spacious and private estate, offering the Clintons a comfortable and peaceful retreat away from the spotlight. The Clintons maintain a residence in Little Rock, Arkansas, where Bill Clinton served as governor before becoming president. This property holds historical significance for the Clintons and serves as a connection to their roots. They also have owned a townhouse in Georgetown in D.C. Georgetown is a historic and prestigious area known for its elegant homes, upscale shops, and vibrant dining scene. The Clintons townhouse provides them with a convenient and sophisticated base in the nation's capital. These properties reflect the Clintons' long-standing presence in American politics and their varied interests in different regions of the country. Mike Pence Mike Pence, the former United States vice president, owns several properties. While specific details about them aren't widely publicized, here's what we know. His primary residence is in Columbus, Indiana, his hometown. Though he has maintained a relatively private personal life, it's likely a spacious and comfortable home where Pence and his family reside when not traveling or in D.C. Pence and his family also own a vacation home in Indiana, and this property provides the Pences with a peaceful retreat where they can relax and spend time together away from the demands of public life. Kamala Harris Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States, owns several properties. Kamala and her husband, Douglas Emhoff, own a home in Brentwood, Los Angeles. Brentwood is an upscale area known for luxurious homes, tree-lined streets, and proximity to the Pacific. 
Kamala previously owned a condo in San Francisco. Located in the city's South of Market neighborhood, the condo served as her primary residence during her time as California's Attorney General and as a U.S. Senator representing the state. Mitt Romney Mitt Romney, a prominent Republican politician and former governor of Massachusetts, is known to own several properties. He owns a large home in Holiday, a suburb of Salt Lake City, Utah. This property has served as his primary residence for many years. The Holiday home is situated on a spacious lot and features luxurious amenities befitting Romney's status as a wealthy businessman and former presidential candidate. He owns a vacation home on Lake Winnipesaukee in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. This property offers Romney and his family a scenic retreat in the lakes region of New Hampshire. Lake Winnipesaukee is known for its crystal clear waters and opportunities for boating, fishing, and other outdoor activities. Romney and his wife, Anne, own a beachfront property in La Jolla, a coastal community in San Diego, California. This property, which overlooks the Pacific Ocean, provides the Romneys with a luxurious getaway in one of California's most desirable coastal areas. Romney also owns a ski-in, ski-out residence in Park City, Utah. Park City is a popular destination for outdoor enthusiasts known for its world-class skiing and vibrant arts and culture scene. His property there offers convenient access to the area's ski slopes and other recreational activities. His real estate holdings provide him and his family with comfortable and luxurious accommodations in various parts of the U.S. Now it's time to hear from you. Which of these properties would you most want to live in? Let us know in the comments section below.